there is, I think, an innate drive in humankind to create, uh, to develop something new, to build on what we already know as a body of knowledge. Uh, the second is that, you know, there is something very spiritual. There is something very special about healing, uh, about uh, helping someone in need, the sick, and trying to make them whole, uh, to help their families. That's what's special about being a physician. And what's special about being a physician scientist is that you take that to one additional level in that we know now that there are some diseases that we cannot cure, so we're limited. We know that we can only go so far with current technology to help our patients and help our families. So when we run up against our limitation, uh, the drive in the researcher in me is to say we can do better. You know, the next patient that I see is not going to die from this cancer. We're going to have them live a longer and better life. And that's to drive, to find the technologies to cure the diseases uh, that are killing my patients. In terms of, of, of work, I mean, I, I, I would have to say, I mean, there's sort of three sort of global things that are four, I would say, that are really things that I really enjoy. Two in work. And in terms of the work, uh, there is sort of an immediate gratification that you get when a patient comes to you with a very complex brain tumor. And you can go and you can remove that brain tumor successfully, restore function in that patient, and have them go home in two or three days. I mean, you've given that patient and their family something, and that makes you feel good. And again, you know, I may allow myself to enjoy that for a few minutes, but then you realize you have four other patients, you need to go and do exactly the same thing for the next day. So you, you never allow yourself to become cocky or conceited. Look how great I am. But, but that's sort of an immediate gratification. Uh, there's a different gratification that comes in research and science, and it's longer term. You know, it's the, it's the thrill of the discovery. Wow. You know, we figured out uh, how this works now. Uh, that we've been working on for five years, and that's it. You know, that's how it how it comes together, and that's that feeling can last for a longer time. It takes a longer time to get to, but you know, you can feel good about that for you know six months or a year because the discoveries are are longer in between. Uh, so those are really sort of the, the the two drives, and then if you can convert that discovery towards a better treatment for your patients. And for example, we've now are working on developing what we call a vaccine for brain cancer that we've taken in the clinical trial uh, and translating that for, for better care for patients with uh, a disease that we do not have a cure for at this time. So in terms of professional gratification, those are the two things. Uh, family, in terms of sort of enjoying your kids, there's nothing like it. Uh, and then there's a fourth for me, which I think is just the sense of adventure with life. Um, you know, being on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro and watching the sunrise or white water rafting down the Zambezi. I mean, those kind of experiences are, are just uh, fantastic. I went into uh, an accelerated program out of high school uh, at the University of Michigan where they took 50 students and we were admitted to both the medical school and undergrad out of high school. And you got your MD degree in six years in addition to your undergrad degree. 
in the first year there, I had an opportunity to take a course in neuroanatomy. And I knew right away. I mean, as soon as I looked and, and started studying the anatomy of the human brain, uh, I realized how incredibly fascinating uh, the human brain is and that that's what I wanted to study. That's what I wanted to do. In addition to just having the grades and the test scores, uh, had demonstrated an, an aptitude really for research and science early on. When I was uh, with my father one summer at the University of Pennsylvania, I would hang around the, the research labs at the University of Pennsylvania, which uh, led me ultimately to uh, try to seek out a, a, a position in a research lab when I went back to Cleveland. Uh, which I actually had an opportunity to start in the 10th grade. So I was doing research uh, at one of the hospitals, St. Luke's Hospital in Cleveland, in the 10th and 11th grade, and essentially spent, you know, half of my 12th grade year doing research in a surgical research lab and published my first paper when I was 17 years old. So, you know, I had demonstrated really a, a focus in science and research which I think made me competitive for the program. I was happy, I was social, I was popular, I liked girls, I liked sports, I had a, uh, a lot of friends. Um, I became, actually I, I became more focused when I was in the ninth grade. I mean, uh, in the seventh and eighth grade, uh, you know, our focus was really having a great time on the weekends and doing sports, and and I knew that I wanted to to be competitive. So I I became more disciplined. I would, you know, get home and study and try to spend more time with my friends on the weekends. Um, I didn't really consider myself to be uh, uh, not well rounded and, and well balanced. I had a good time. It was actually for my research that I was doing uh, in the 10th and 11th grade. Um, I was working in the lab of uh, a heart surgeon who had developed his own artificial heart valve. And I had a concept that the heart valve might be damaging red blood cells. So I asked to do a research project using a scanning electron microscope at the time. Uh, and when I was trying to um, basically uh, learn the technique. I took some blood from the heart-lung bypass machine, a patient's undergoing heart-lung bypass. And when I incubated the red blood cells overnight, I noticed that a certain percentage of these cells changed from their normal discord shape uh, to one that resembled a porcupine called an iconocyte. And what I did was to describe the discocyte iconocyte transformation in patients undergoing heart-lung bypass. Uh, and as an index of sublethal red blood cell damage. The importance being that the blood cells could not parachute through the small capillaries. Normally a capillary is about five microns and the blood cell is seven and it has to parachute through. The econocytes get stuck and can cause blockage in those capillaries. When I got into the six-year medical program, I was, I was actually scared. I mean, I said, I'm not a genius. You know, all these kids coming into class are, are going to be genius. I'm going to get blown away. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun at all. Uh, but I remember the first class that we had. It was uh, sort of an accelerated chemistry class, ex especially for our group. Uh, and. Uh, it was essentially inorganic chemistry, you know, basically moles and molecules. But we had uh, a professor who had both a PhD in chemistry and biology at the age of 23. And uh, I remember studying for my classmates for the first quiz that he had. And, you know, you were all in the same dorm and you go to their room and ask a question about this problem. They said, oh yeah, on page 45, you know, it's this equation like this on page 45. <laughs> Oh my goodness, this isn't going to be good. And I walked into the, to the quiz, and we looked at it, 
in the quiz was if you have two organisms, organism A and organism B, and organism A utilizes carbohydrate as its main energy source, and organism B utilizes protein, and you put them both in a capsule with two liters of oxygen and you shoot them off to the moon, which one is going to run out of oxygen first? And I said, well, this doesn't have anything to do with what we were studying. And then I realized what it was. I mean, it's a conceptual problem. You take what you had learned and you apply it and then you figure out and convert the moles to oxygen and so forth and figure out how many moles are going to be converted to carbon dioxide. Um, but the people that had memorized all the equations had a very difficult time. Conceptually, I was very good, so I figured out real quick, wrote it down, and walked out after about 15 minutes. And everybody thought I was the genius. Uh, but it was, uh, I found it very easy because, you know, they wanted you to, to sort of conceptualize and to think, not just to memorize. Uh, and I had a good time. Uh, uh, I enjoyed it. It, it, it uh, I, I could sort of get done what I needed to, to do, and, and I actually started doing research because I had additional spare time. And I also had time in those years to learn to fly. I got my pilot license and, and uh, traveled around, did a lot of scuba diving and so forth. So I had a great time. In medical school, you know, you're required to sort of memorize the body of facts. You go to gross anatomy and, you know, you learn what muscles attach where and what goes where. You, you're memorizing. When you go into the research lab, you're creating new knowledge. And it was play for me. I mean, it was like doing art or writing poetry or, or painting on a canvas. So it wasn't work. When I was in the research lab, from 2 to 4 o'clock in the morning. It wasn't work for me, it was play. It's what I enjoy doing. Now, for someone that didn't like research, it would be really hard work. But for someone who enjoyed it, it was fun. If you are an infrastructure person, um, and if what is required of you is to just sort of give back the facts, then it may not be important to be creative. Um, and you certainly don't have to be creative to be a good doctor. In fact, you know, you don't necessarily want a doctor that's sort of creating as he goes. Um, you want a doctor who's going who's gonna to sort of follow, you know, the cookbook. And there's a big difference between being a doctor and being a scientist. But being a, uh, a good scientist is all about creativity. I mean, it's all about creating what we don't know. And uh, so the, the, the creative aspect of it really becomes critical. But in addition to being creative, I mean, it's not enough to be creative. I mean, you have to sort of be creative and you have to figure out how you're going to prove what your creative concept is, which is different from an artist. An artist can just paint and say, here, go out and interpret it. A scientist has to create and then prove that his concepts are correct and have the discipline to do that. And then after he proves his concepts are correct, he then has to go out and communicate to the rest of the world what he's proven, because if he keeps it to himself, then it's not a discovery. Growing up in the South, for an African American, has some advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages uh, was that you had a lot of role models. Uh, you had black teachers, black principals, black doctors, black lawyers. I mean, you know, you you saw people like yourself uh, in uh, uh, roles of leadership within your community because your community was isolated. Um, in the fifth grade. Uh, we integrated uh, the school system, uh, and I actually only spent a, a year uh, in the fifth grade in an integrated setting at the time. Uh, my, my family was very active uh, in the South. My father had uh, done his graduate training 
in education at the University of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Went back to Auburn, Alabama as principal of the all-black elementary school there and was very active in integrating the staff, teaching French to the students in the fourth grade, the black school, uh, having, you know, the best library, even though we had, you know, not the best books at the time in the school system. And uh, also instilling in his students a sense of civil disobedience uh, to speak out against uh, injustice. So it was, it was an interesting time sort of the best of times and the worst of times in, in that uh, there were some advantages and that you did have a very supportive community, uh, but you were not a part of the larger community. You were isolated from the larger community and some larger opportunities. I was happy. Uh, I was happy and I was uh, inquisitive. Um, as early as I can remember, I, I always had a sense of fascination with biology, anything related to biology. Uh, even though it's not politically correct to say now, uh, when I was eight years old, one of the things I would enjoy doing was to go out with my BB gun with my friends and shoot birds to get them back to the house, to operate on them, to, to save them, to get the BB out. You know, to do the surgery, to, to remove the BB, uh, and, uh, you know, dissecting frogs. And, and uh, my father actually saw me dissect a frog heart uh, and observed my sense of curiosity uh, with science and then went out and got me a chicken heart and I dissected that and, and uh, then went to the slaughterhouse and got me a larger cow heart, which was really incredible because here's this big huge heart with all these different chambers and allowed me to dissect that and it really instilled a sense of curiosity in me but my love was always science and always biology and I had a sense of fascination with that. I think one of the um, true gifts that one can have is to find out what it is that they truly love to do. Uh, for some people, it's playing the piano. For others, it might be swimming or some sort of athletic event. For me, it was science. And I happened to get lucky enough to find that my love was science, um, which I still love. And what that allows me to do, essentially, is as a scientist and as a, as a neurosurgeon, is uh, I don't work. Uh, when I go to work, I mean, it's what I love to do. I uh, if I didn't get paid for what I wanted to do, I would want to pay to do it. Uh, so one is very blessed to, to find what it is that they love to do. The other thing that it does, it allows you to really devote uh, the focus, the hours, uh, the, the intensity in, into whatever it is to become very good at it. Um, whatever you do, you're going to have to spend a lot of time perfecting your craft, perfecting your art. So if I'm up late uh, working on a research project or working to save a patient's life, it's not work for me. It's what I enjoy doing, and uh, uh, it's not difficult to do if you're having fun. I had a very supportive family. Uh, I considered my father to be the ultimate educator. So even though <clears throat> there was never any pressure. It was, you know, you got to bring home this grade, or you have to go do this. I mean, he was, uh, he was sort of the invisible hand. He was, you know, he would observe uh, what one loved to do, and, and he would cultivate that. He would, he would, he was a teacher. And uh, my brother is is very different for me. My brother. You know, it's in an entirely different field. You know, he's pursuing business. And, you know, we were both sort of cultivated and, and challenged in the environment. I, I grew up in an intellectually challenging environment is that in that when we sat down for dinner at the table, uh, it was always uh, some sort of intellectual debate with my father at, at a very young age. I mean, you would come in and say, you know, Dad, the sky is blue. He would say, no, it's not blue. You would sit there for 30 minutes trying to convince them that the sky was blue. <laughs> it 
Some of the books that I really enjoyed were uh, books by some of the African American authors, you know, Baldwin, um, you know, Go Tell It on the Mountain. It sort of gave a, a sense of warmth and, and, and uh, sort of understanding of one's own sort of environment uh, in some of those books. There, there was never any, any uh, book. Uh, except for one related to medicine. And I remember reading The Making of a Surgeon uh, when I was uh, in probably about the sixth or seventh grade. And uh, that was, that was a, a book that sort of kind of got me focused, I think, on the, on the career path. And I remember one thing in there I still remember is that you can always tell when you've really arrived as a surgeon, when the uh, when the nurses in the hospital ask you to be their physician. I think it's, it's a combination of luck, of uh, discipline, uh, of sort of the right nurturing and the right environment. I think luck in the sense in that I found what I love to do. I mean, had I been sort of directed to a different career, I may not be as successful. Uh, if Michael Jordan was playing baseball, he, you know, he may not be Michael Jordan as, as we know it. Um, so, you know, I think one of the most important things is to find what you love to do. And if, it, if you're lucky enough that what you love to do is also what you have a talent at doing, you know, that's a real plus. And then, you know, having the right nurturing. And then, you know, having the drive. You have to have the drive. It's not good enough just to say, oh, I'm really good at this. You have to work at it. I mean, you know, you have to still sort of develop your craft to develop your art and to perfect it. I've done almost 4,000 operations for brain tumors. I mean, you know, I'm thinking of what's going to happen, you know, 10, 12 steps before. You know, I'm anticipating what's going to happen in the operation. Um, and I'm comfortable with where we are. I mean, I, I have an intensive drive, you know, to find a cure. And, but I, I know that we can only do the best that we can do. Uh, I think the other things I have more of a fear about, uh, you know, trying to be the man that my father was uh, in terms of being, you know, a good father, uh, really providing sort of the inspiration, nurture, and foundation to my kids that he provided to his. I think one of the hopes that we all have is that, you know, the world is, will recognize us for what our talents are, and, and uh, you work hard, you do a good job, and, and that's it. Unfortunately, as we all know, there's politics, uh, there are uh, people with different political agendas uh, that are not necessarily motivated uh, by the same moral sort of uh, drives that you might have. I mean, people do things not necessarily for the best interests of patients or for humanity. You know, they may do it for the best interest of themselves. And so uh, we have to deal with those political obstacles which can divert a lot of time and, and energy. Uh, and that can be annoying sometimes because, you know, as you say, it's hard enough trying to find a cure for cancer and have to stop back and say, wait a minute, what is this political agenda here? And they have to be wise enough to circumnavigate those to achieve your objective. I think you never read your news stories. Um, you know, I've, I've had a, a, a fair amount uh, for physician scientists of, of media exposure. And uh, one of the things I tend to do is to ignore it. Um, and uh, to essentially stay focused 
on the ball, to stay focused on what the objective is, and to not sort of let that become part of, of what you are. Uh, because it, it, it's, it's, it's not really who you are. I mean, who you are is, is what you do and what your work is. Um, I think the notoriety is important because it shows other people the path. Uh, but besides that, what's really important is what you do. I think that it's important to just kind of follow a couple of principles. Um, doing what you love to do. Uh, being in the right environment. Making the right environment for yourself. And by doing, by what I mean by making the right environment, if you want to do something, one of the smartest things that you can do is to go find someone that's done it and to try to get them to show you how they did it, to show you where the potholes are, uh, you know, what, what are the right steps to get there. If, if you want to be an uh, NBA basketball star, you know, go try to find people that are stars or, and, and to try to get them to become your mentors. If you want to become a brain surgeon, go find a brain surgeon or brain surgeons and to try to have them be a mentor. And not just in terms of, you know, where to go to school, but, you know, uh, what are the things that are really tough that you have to overcome, and how did you overcome it? Uh, just having the, the drive and the, uh, and the discipline and the focus, you know, to not take no for an answer. Uh, when you run up against an obstacle uh, to do what I call the principle of Tai Chi. You know, karate takes a force and it opposes it with the force. But in most obstacles that you run up, up against, you're outgunned and you're outnumbered. So you're not going to overcome it with force. Uh, one of the smartest things that you can do is to take that force and turn it back against itself, which is what Tai Chi does. Uh, and to enjoy what you do, uh, because if you're, if you're not having fun at it, you're going to get tired real quick. Uh, but if you, if you do what you enjoy, if you're disciplined, if you find mentors, uh, if you use your head when you come up against an obstacle uh, and find a way to overcome that obstacle, and to keep moving forward or to move around and move forward. You get to where you want to go. One of the, the great mentors that I had was, uh, was a doctor by the name of O.T. Randall when I was a medical student at University of Michigan. He was a professor in cardiology. And I was working in his research lab. But the best time with him was not designing the research project, but it was at the end of the day when we would sit in the in the lab and listen to some John Coltrane or Miles Davis and he would tell me about the obstacles that he had just faced in, for example, getting promoted from assistant professor to associate professor with tenure and sort of the politics in doing that and the strategy that he used to sort of overcome that. Uh, and I would listen and then I realized that 10 years later, when I was facing the same obstacles, that I would use some of his same strategies that, he, that I was listening to him talk about 10 years ago. That's what being a mentor is all about, is sort of building up that repertoire so that when you have to use it five years or 10 years later, you know, you have it sort of in, in that background. That's a long list. <laughs> Find a cure to brain cancer. Uh, I would love to do that. Uh, I would uh, uh, love to 
developed two great kids, a daughter and a son, who are, who are doing something that they love to do and happy and are successful uh, at doing it. Um, and I, I think I, uh, one of my interests now uh, is actually beginning to uh, move into the whole field of developing a biotechnology company, which is something that I, I haven't done before. I've been professor, I've been teacher, I've been surgeon, I've been researcher. But moving into the realm of, of business now and sort of taking the technology and creating a business enterprise from it, I think it's, it's a new venture for me uh, because the skill set becomes very different and it's a new challenge. But I think essentially the real economic boom in the next five or ten years is in the area of biotechnology. I think it's going to be unlike anything that we've ever seen before. And uh, the major breakthroughs are going to be with biotechnology firms, simply from an economic standpoint. Uh, if, you, if you're working as a researcher in a research lab, you're lucky if you get a grant for a half million dollars to a million dollars a year. It takes a hundred million dollars to get one compound from the lab into, into clinical practice. So as a researcher relying on grants, you would never have the resources that you need to rapidly accelerate your discoveries into clinical treatments. The only way to do it is with dollars from the private enterprise sector. So one of the things that we're looking at doing now is to, is to build uh, a biotechnology company where we would have the resources to take the technologies from the bench to the bedside. Well, I think that it really becomes uh, a national question. I don't think that any one individual uh, has the answer in terms of whether we have our national priorities straight because what we are, are a collection of about 300 million individuals and then you know, what are the priorities of those 300 million individuals that make them sort of unique from China uh, or from you know, uh, Italy example. Uh, I would like to see us, though, in, in a real sense, uh, you know, take some of the money that we spend on the military. I think, I think the concept of war is obsolete. I mean, war is not going to be waged with guns. It's going to be waged on the economic business front. Uh, and to convert some of those dollars, number one, to saving our environment, to figuring out how we're going to cut down on, on the greenhouse effect and global warming and, uh, and not pollute our oceans. I mean, you know, nothing matters if we cannot inhabit this planet. Uh, to really begin to uh, make health care a national priority because we have an opportunity now unlike anything that we've ever had in history. Uh, the national budget spends about $2.8 billion a year on cancer research. Uh, you take a couple of B-2 bombers and you could double the national cancer budget, for example, which is killing a half a million people a year. So you could save a million lives, one million lives, by accelerating finding a cure for cancer by two years. I mean, we are concerned because we lost 30,000 people in Vietnam for example, I think it's 60,000, but I mean, you know, the numbers are staggering in comparison. Uh, I think, you know, the billions of dollars we spent landing an astronaut on the moon uh, that really had no real scientific objective because we wanted to beat the Russians. You know, and Kennedy said in 62, you know, we're going to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade, you know, really as sort of a... a you know, sibling rivalry between two countries. Uh, you know, if we had that same sense of urgency about finding a cure for cancer or, or uh, 
Alzheimer's disease or neurological disorders, spinal cord injury, head injury, you know, the, the results would be staggering. And the impact on humanity in comparison to a couple of moon rocks in the National uh, Space Museum to saving millions of lives would be incomparable. That's a tough one. Um, I would, um, I would probably say uh, one book that I would read to him is The Art of War. Um, because it teaches, I think, certain lessons uh, in life that, you know, they can apply throughout their life in, in terms of sort of overcoming obstacles uh, and learning how to deal with, uh, with uh, confrontations in a strategic way that are placed in, in front of them. And it would probably give them a, a better chance of success. I, th I think that was ultimately important to me is growth. Um, and I, I would have to say the most important thing is spiritual growth. I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're giving so many years to inhabit this planet, you know, whether it's 20 or 40 or 60 or 80 years, in which we can learn something. I mean, I have to believe that, or else, you know, why are we, why are we here? So we have an opportunity to, to come to a place to experience a lot of things during the time that we have, and hopefully to grow and to learn something from that experience, and to leave it a better uh, uh, place than I think we found it, and for us to leave us better individuals than what we were when we first arrived. And ultimately what it really ends up being in the end is spiritual growth. It's not about money. Um, it's not about fame. Uh, and the only thing that we can really hope for, because there's no safety in the end, we never know when the end is up for us. But the only thing that we can hope for is that our soul and our spirit is in order and that we've grown, and that we've helped people along the way. I think that uh, the American dream is an evolving concept because it's never been entirely true, uh, particularly for uh, minority groups. I mean, you know, the concept that, you know, there's equal opportunity never really meant equal opportunity for everybody. And it still doesn't mean equal opportunity today. Uh, uh, if you're an African-American child in South Central L LA uh, in a school uh, without the sort of uh, capabilities as a student in Beverly Hills who's going to a private institution, even though you, you may have the same intellectual capability, you do not have the same opportunity. Um, and I think in an idealized fashion, what the American dream means is that there's equal opportunity for every American. Uh, we're a long ways from achieving that dream. That dream. Uh, and I think uh, as a society, uh, I would have to say the American dream is an evolving concept. The American dream should really be how do we actually, as a nation, get to the concept where the American dream is a reality.